Officially, out-of-play penalties are now called rendering an opponent unable to block, which is pretty darn descriptive, but a bit of a mouthful. Technically, only two verbal cues use the phrase out-of-play, which is the out-of-play warning for being outside the engagement zone, and the out-of-play block. But it is pretty common to think of several more items, all of which we'll talk about shortly, as also being out-of-play. Therefore, you'll hear me talk a lot about being out of play instead of rendering an opponent unable to block. But for purposes of this presentation, they'll be interchangeable. Out of play penalties seem to be rife with misunderstanding and myth, both on the part of skaters and officials alike. This leads to a whole boatload of frustrations from skaters as they hear different explanations from different referees and incorrect or missing verbal cues. Speaking of verbal cues, out of play has two different penalties for no packs that are called very differently, and often the only way for skaters to differentiate the two are from the verbal cues. But we'll get into that later. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level four referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. This presentation was originally created on January 17, 2016 and updated on June 10, 2017 for the updated rule set for the WFTDA and MRDA. I started watching Flat Track Roller Derby in 2005 and the idea of packs, pack definition and engagement zones just didn't exist. This meant that when it became advantageous, one team could just take off and sprint away from the opposing jammer, and there was nothing the other team could do about it. This became known as runaway pussy, and is the kind of thing that can happen when the rule book is only nine pages long. To risk comparing roller derby to another sport, pack definitions and out-of-play penalties are roller derby's equivalent to the shot clock and over and back rules in basketball. It ensures that there is a reasonable distance for players to be from each other and that both teams have an opportunity to score. Let's start with a list of the different out-of-play penalties that we have and then go into the details of each one later. First, here's the list. Destroying the pack. Failing to reform the pack. Failing to return into the engagement zone. Blocking or assisting during a no-pack or outside the engagement zone and lapping or being lapped by the pack. I want to start with destroying the pack and failing to return because in the event there are skaters watching this, I know from experience that there is a lot of confusion on identifying which penalty a skater has been assessed. I hope this helps both skater and referee alike. Pack destruction is a process of actively creating a no pack situation. An easy example is a team all slowing down to allow their jammer past the opposing blockers, who can no longer engage the jammer because of the no pack. The team that slowed down took an obvious action that forced the no pack. They are responsible for that action and therefore get the penalty. That penalty is called immediately. There is no delay between the no pack call and the penalty. The penalty occurred as soon as the no pack happened. The only reason why this penalty might not be called first is that we also need to get the teams back together in a pack. The verbal cue for pack destruction is destroying the pack. Now let's get into the subtleties of pack destruction. While it's easy to use the big obvious example I just used, they don't have to be that big. I had a game a few years ago where a team in a passive offense situation figured out exactly where my 10-foot distance was, and then would move an inch or two back, causing the no-pack. Because the teams were barely moving, it was passive offense, 
and the movement of the team was slight, I decided at the time the destruction was gradual and didn't issue a penalty. It then happened again and again and again. Of course, the idea of gradual destruction of the pack was something that was from the old rules. And that word, or even similar words, have all been excised from the rules. Not because we're allowing it, but because we're now judging by the impact the action causes, rather than trying to pigeonhole types of movement. In that scenario, the new title of the rule nails the action down completely. They rendered their opponents unable to block. So now, we don't have to guess on what's gradual or not, but instead break down the situation. Was there a no pack? Yes. Was it caused by a deliberate action by one team? Yes. Did it cause impact on the game? Yes, it did. It forced the other team to stop blocking the jammer, giving that jammer easy points. Let's talk a little bit about how the pack is defined and how to judge a more normal destruction penalty. And for that, we need to break out the pack away from pack speed. The pack is a physical location of the blockers and has nothing to do with pack destructions, only pack definition. More often than not, I'll unscientifically say 95% of the time, you can't have a pack destruction without a defined pack speed. Because a pack involves skaters from both teams, this means that a pack speed also involves skaters from both teams. At least one member of each team, although usually, but not necessarily the majority of blockers on the track, must be traveling at roughly the same speed to have a pack speed. As soon as they are traveling the same speed, a pack speed has been established, and any variation of that speed has to be taken by both teams, or there will be a destruction of the pack penalty. Even though the term gradual has been taken out of the rules, we can use the idea to keep us from overcalling this penalty and better judge the impact of the no pack. A rule of thumb, if you will. But if you remember my example where I got burned repeatedly, gradual does not mean a short distance, but instead requires a long distance. Let's say that one team is skating consistently at 10 miles per hour and the other at 9.9 .9 miles per hour. If, during the entire jam, they stayed at that speed, you would eventually, slowly, see the other team pull away, causing the no pack. This would be a gradual pack destruction and should not have a penalty assessed. Pack speed is important because there are only four ways to have a no pack without having a destruction penalty. The first is during a jam start. At the start of the jam, there is no mutually defined pack speed, because before the jam, there is no pack. The second is because of a block, be it successful or missed. If there's one opposing skater in the pack, and I knock that skater out of bounds, I should not get a destruction of the pack call. The third is due to an injury or other safety condition on the track that doesn't end the jam. The casebook refers to a skater with a malfunctioning safety pad that removes themselves from the track, causing the no pack. And the fourth is because there is no mutually defined pack speed between the teams. After that game I told you about, I started going into games with the mentality that if there was a no pack called, then there should be a destruction of the pack penalty issued, and that it was my job to find out who should get it. If there is a pack speed, and nobody's been blocked down to cause the no pack, there is a destruction call to be made. And yes, if both teams take off in opposite directions, you can issue destruction calls to both teams. Over the last few years, I've tempered this a bit, and the new rules justify that tempering, where I can look for pack destructions that have no impact. If the no pack is an eighth of a second and there's no jammer, there really doesn't need to be a call. There may not even be a need to call a no pack if it was just a wavering skater and it comes right back together. Again, what kind of impact is it causing? Not much. But once a jammer is in play, however, the stakes are much higher than if it's just the blockers hanging out together. And despite my becoming more flexible, I'd still say 
that pack destruction penalties are still one of the most missed calls during a game. Failure to reform penalties are also called during a no-pack. But unlike destructions, they occur after the no-pack is called. This is why there's often so much confusion from skaters. They've often received the destroying the pack penalty when they think they've had a failure to reform without adequate time. Failure to reform is broken into two separate penalties, although with the same verbal cue, immediate and sustained. To avoid an immediate failure to reform, it doesn't necessarily require that the pack be reformed, but that the teams are actively moving to rectify the situation as quickly as reasonably possible. This means that the teams have to disengage from their opponents, and if they're in the back of the mass of skaters, skate forward, and if they're in the front of the mass of skaters, cease their forward momentum enough for the group in the back to catch up, up to and including stopping. The group in the front do not need to skate backwards. They can, but the most they are obligated to do is stop. The point of contention, or at least a common question is, what is the time frame between the no-pack call and when the first failure to reform penalty is issued? There is no specified time frame. Not only is there no three-second rule left in the rules, it never applied to failure to reform penalties to begin with. So if someone trots that out, bop them over the head with a foam mallet. Most of the people I know say they use a beat. I think maybe because they're more musical than I am. But when I think of beat, I think of it in the theatrical context. Wiktionary defines the theatrical beat as, quote, the moment at which increasing dramatic tension produces a noticeable change in the consciousness of one or more characters, unquote. For me, I use that beat to be, should there have been a noticeable change in their consciousnesses? If so, and there's no action, then we have met the criteria for failure to reform. For me, my reaction time is usually this. No pack, failure to reform. But because we don't have an explicitly defined delay, we are allowed to make allowances for the skill level of the players we are officiating for. Newer or less skilled players will have a slower reaction time than players from a Division I team. Older rule sets had the additional penalty of sustained failure to reform, which as you might imagine would be called after the immediate failure to reform. The immediate failure to reform penalty was given because nobody did anything to fix the no pack. And again, using your imagination, continuing to do nothing will also be sufficient for the sustained failure. And even though the specific sustained failure to reform penalty has been removed from the rules for simplicity, the idea behind it still remains. If you've already issued a failure to reform penalty and nobody's acting to reform the pack, then another penalty is warranted. Same verbal cue, same hand signal, same result as another skater goes to the penalty box. Although you might want to make sure that your hand signals are visible and your verbal cues are loud enough to be heard, as this situation is pretty rare. I'll be mentioning immediate and sustained failures to reform as we continue on this subject, mostly because it helps differentiate at what point certain calls should be made. Continuing to block an opponent during an OPAC can be an easy way to determine if there's a sustained failure as well. After all, if they're blocking an opponent, they're certainly not reforming the pack. Keep in mind that if there's a block occurring, but there's an adequate immediate attempt to reform by teammates, the blockers shouldn't receive a penalty unless they knock the opponent down, out of bounds, or change relative position. However, during a sustained failure to reform, they have no such luxury. The entirety of their action must be to reforming the pack, and blocking is not reforming the pack. If it helps, think of it this way. We're giving the blockers a little fudge room up until that first failure to reform penalty. But after that, their grace period is over. They're now causing serious impact by continuing to block. Remember that failure to reform doesn't mean a successful reformation must occur, only that blockers must, to the best of their ability, attempt to reform a pack. That means moving your legs around in the 
oh, I'm skating so hard motion that doesn't actually go anywhere does not count. It means real effort. An easy point to miss is that the blockers from the front are only required to come to, and if you're issuing sustained failures to reform, they probably should be, at a standstill. If those blockers at the front are at a standstill, then you should be looking to the blockers in the back for not speeding up enough to reform that pack. If the blockers at the front aren't slowing down, or slowing down enough, or still engaging opponents, you should start issuing them penalties for sustained failure to reform but you should also have to keep looking at the back to make sure they're not engaging any opponents either. Note that blocks during a no-pack that cause a loss of relative position are going to be penalized regardless if there's someone trying to actively reform or not. Those penalties would be out-of-play blocks as opposed to failure to reforms. Let's look at two uncommon scenarios that you should know of. They're uncommon, but I've seen them multiple times, so they do come up. When we think of no pack situations, we think of two distinct groups of skaters. In the era of passive offense, usually all of one team in the front and the other in the back, although you can still have mixed but equal groups of both teams at each mass. You can also have three distinct groups. In this diagram, we have the foremost and middle groups with an even mix from both teams and two skaters hanging 15 feet behind the middle group. How do they reform? The back group must accelerate and the frontmost group must slow down, coming to a halt if necessary. The middle group can do either. The one thing they can't do is try to avoid reforming by trying to pace the back group to delay the reformation as long as possible. How they do this is probably academic, unless their teammates outside the middle group are colluding with them. But as long as the middle group speeds up or slows down, they should reform with at least one of the other groups. The second uncommon scenario has to do with players knocked out of bounds. Here's the common version. A player is knocked out of bounds, causing the no-pack, which is legal because you can do that via a block, but has teammates further up the track. The team that knocked the player out of bounds must attempt to reform the pack with the other skaters in front. If for some reason the pack hasn't reformed, once the out-of-bounds blocker can re-enter the track legally, he is required in order to fulfill his requirement to reform the pack. Now let's remove the blockers from up front. We have a team with a single blocker on the track who is knocked out of bounds. The no pack is issued. Who is required to do what? The player blocked out of bounds, like all other blockers, is required to reform the pack as soon as possible, but is not required to skate clockwise. There is only one time you are obligated to skate clockwise on the track, and this isn't it. We'll get to that later. He can skate clockwise if he wishes, but cannot be penalized for simply stopping and waiting for a legal point to re-enter. The other team, however, has the same obligation to reform the pack, and since the only way to reform the pack is to have that out-of-bounds blocker re-enter, all players, the out-of-bounds skater must enter behind, must skate forward in order to allow that blocker to re-enter the track. Those skaters not moving forward should be issued a failure to reform on their part, not on the skater who has been blocked out of bounds. The skater out of bounds would be liable for penalties only if he fails to re-enter the track once he can legally do so. If this scenario happens, be prepared for a timeout, official review, or just a request to explain at halftime or at the end of the game. Skaters are so often used to knocking someone out of bounds and trying to soul crush them by skating clockwise to lengthen the time it takes to re-enter that they don't realize that they can't do this when there's only one blocker for their opponents left on the track or happen to knock all of their opponents out of bounds. Now, let's talk about failure return. 
The main difference between failure to return and failure to reform is that there is a pack in failure to return, but the skaters subject to the penalty are out of play. Failure to return also requires a warning to be given, both the out of play hand signal and the verbal out of play cue. I use the same metric for failure to return as I do on reforms during a no pack. Out of play, failure to return. And like the difference between the no pack warning and the failure penalty, you can give allowances for the game you are officiating. Just be consistent on it throughout the game. As I mentioned earlier, there is one scenario where the rules compels blockers to skate clockwise. And that is when the pack is skating clockwise and the blocker is out of play in the front of the pack. I thought this would never happen. Then in one year, I had it happen to me five times. Sometimes for multiple laps. Normally, an out of play skater in the front like with a no pack, merely has to come to a stop if she is out of play in the front. This is because the pack is normally moving counterclockwise and will eventually catch up and put that out of play skater back in the engagement zone, if not the pack itself. This is why we require skaters in the back, again, like in a no pack situation, to skate forward in order to rejoin normal play. And if there's no forward skating after issuing the out-of-play warning, we should issue the failure to return penalty. However, if the pack is moving clockwise, those rules are reversed. And now those out-of-play in the front must skate clockwise to return to the pack, lest they be lapped. Does this happen much? No, not often. But I have been on one game where the penalty did have to be issued. It was kind of surreal but really cool that the referee nailed it. One important part of failure to return warnings, or no pack warnings for that matter, is that we as referees, or more specifically, the referees designated by the head referee, as generally we don't want jam refs or outside pack refs doing pack definition, must give the physical and verbal warning. But if the skaters fail to hear or see the warnings, it does not excuse them from being penalized. Do all we can, but if they can't hear, they can't hear. One of the changes in the 2017 rules was that skaters who are out of bounds are no longer allowed to stay out of bounds when they can otherwise legally re-enter the track. At the time of this recording, there's no verbal cue for this action, so take this as a suggestion, not as a rule. But in the diagram... The purple pivot can legally re-enter the track but has not yet done so. A referee needs to warn that skater to re-enter the track before a penalty can be issued, similar to a failure to return penalty. Keep in mind that if someone is in front of who they have to enter behind, they are not required to skate backwards. They can remain still if they so choose, up until the point where they must re-enter the track. Using this example, I would instruct the pivot to return to the track, using the same return to track hand signal that goes with the verbal cue. If the skater refuses to re-enter the track, issue an out of play penalty, possibly using the failure to return verbal cue. One important warning about this, if the skater doesn't know who to return behind, don't direct that skater into a cut and don't issue a failure to return penalty. I would hold off until that skater is behind all the other in play blockers. It's more fair to the skater out of bounds and to that skater's opponents who are trying to delay that skater's return by legal means. So in this diagram, say that purple blocker one only has to re-enter behind yellow number two, but doesn't know it. I would leave it until the skater's behind all the opposing blockers before starting to go into issuing warnings and possibly penalties. Blocking out of play can sound similar to what we were talking about with failure to reforms, except this is a little broader. In failure to reform and failure to return, blocks were essentially no impact in the block itself, but used to determine if the skater was bothering to reform the pack or not. With an out of play block, there's actual impact, 
the opponent has been significantly impeded, knocked down or out of bounds, or knocked back into the engagement zone. Less often, but still illegal, is the assisting out of play. I hope this part is pretty straightforward. Basically, if the skaters are out of play, the only thing legal is jammer on jammer engagements. But something I see from time to time is the jammer engaging on an out of play blocker. A jammer can counter block while out of play, but if the jammer is the instigator of the block, she can still get a penalty for an out of play block. As we start winding down, a couple penalties that are probably the rarest of them all, at least for out of play penalties, are lapping the pack or having been lapped by the pack. About the only time I see someone lapping the pack is if there's a failed star pass and the pivot has the jammer cover and thinks she's the jammer. For more details on this, I'll recommend you check out the star pass module here at refet.com. But short of that, I would give the pivot a lot of leeway. Chances are you'll need to issue a failure to return penalty before giving one for having lapped the pack. Being lapped by the pack is more rare, but at least it's an easier scenario to visualize. One thing that comes to mind is an injured skater that isn't down, but not keeping up with the pack as well. Again, like with the star pass, I'd be less tempted to issue a penalty for being lapped by the pack and more tempted to end the jam for an apparent injury. If the skater isn't injured, there should be a failure to return penalty issued before the pack lapser. I'm going to wrap up by covering expulsions for out-of-play blocking. But unlike most of the other rules, out-of-play is a state of being rather than an action. So I thought taking you through my one expulsion for an out-of-play penalty might work better in explaining just what might be expulsion worthy with regards to being out of play. The situation was this. A skater left the penalty box and blocked a jammer some 60 feet out of play. The block was very hard, but otherwise clean, had it been in the engagement zone anyway. In this situation, there could be absolutely no doubt that the skater knew that she was out of play but proceeded to perform the block anyway. So what makes this act, to use the glossary, quote, a serious illegal action such as physical violence or any action deemed by the officials to cause extraordinary physical threat to others, unquote. At that physical location of the track, there is zero reason for the jammers to expect a block, let alone a hard one, and they would not be physically prepared for it. Most jammers, when they enter the pack, and they know they're going to have to grind out a pass rather than zip through it untouched, crouch down somewhat in order to take or possibly dish out the forthcoming blocks. On the other side of the track, it's about speed and preparing for the next pass, and that's what opens up jammers for an injury. I can think of ways to muddy the waters a bit, say if there were other blockers also out of play trying to return to the pack, or if the distance was 5 to 10 feet away from the engagement zone, but it wasn't, and there was little doubt in accepting the recommendation for expulsion. Pack definition is probably one of the hardest skills to learn in refing roller derby. Judging 10 and 20 feet in a constantly shifting and moving mass of people can and is pretty difficult, especially when first starting out. Keeping track of that same mass of people and issuing penalties, let alone the correct ones, just makes the job harder. So those who can are greatly valued. Before we kick off the end credits, I wanted to include a diagram of the various verbal cues and types of autoplay penalties. Feel free to pause the video and print out a screenshot if you think it'll help. I would like to thank both Jimmy Digital and Neil Gunner for permission to use their photographs in this presentation. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. If you found this presentation helpful, 
or think it or other presentations at RefEd.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.